which is being hosted by Calgary Pride and our friends at the U.S. Consulate General of Calgary. We're so pleased to be here today and we're really, we're really excited to start this courageous conversation on a topic that is, we've been working together on some time and we feel like it is a topic that um, affects a lot of people but doesn't necessarily get um, sometimes the attention that it deserves. Before we get started, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement and then we'll move into the rest of the program pieces. In the spirit of respect, reciprocity and truth, Calgary Pride is an, is an inhabitant of Calgary, Alberta, honors and acknowledges Mokinstis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Nitsitsapi Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pikani, as well as Yare Nakoda and Tsutsina nations. We acknowledge that the territory we work and live upon is home to the Metis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Metis homeland. Today, we are also lucky to be joined by folks from across Turtle Island on both sides of the colonial US and Canadian borders as guests on our panel and folks in attendance who may call many places home. We encourage everyone to learn more about the first, the first people of your area. We're really excited about today's conversation, which is happening on the eve of Pride Week. We realized that the topic of the intersection of identity and faith is one that is complex and one that is nuanced and that there are, there are many complexities and it's very much a spectrum and there's different lived experiences within that. For this session today, we're hoping to have a courageous conversation where we can learn and grow and reflect and, and start one conversation of many. At the same time, we realize that there's a spectrum of perspectives that are going to be present here today and the experiences and, and knowledge and wisdom that's being shared is very much in line with the panelists that are there, but there are also other perspectives and other lived experiences as well. And we recognize that and we honor that. I'd like to now turn it over to our moderator who is a local Calgarian, Keith Murray. And Keith uses the pronouns they, them, and they are the affirming coordinator at Hillhurst United Church. And I'm really excited for Keith to guide us through this conversation um, and make it a courageous and exciting conversation. Keith is a queer faith leader and transdisciplinary artist, a writer, a designer, activist, speaker, and facilitator. Keith's work has been recognized and exhibited internationally. They were the first residents in union at the Theo Theological Seminary in New York. Keith currently leads the thriving 2S LGBTQ plus affirming ministries at Hillhurst United Church and is also a candidate for the ordained ministry in the United Church of Canada. I'll now hand it over to Keith to take it over for this event. Thank you so much, Hasina, and welcome everyone. It is so good to see you all here, even though I cannot see you all. I know you're there and we're gonna have an amazing conversation today. We have some incredible um, panelists here who have, as Hasina mentioned, diverse backgrounds and stories to tell. And I know this will prove to be an enriching experience for all of us. Um, this panel is called Intersections of Faith and Identity. Um, and we're going to be exploring some really interesting topics here. And this is put on as a partnership between Calgary Pied and the United States Consulate in Calgary. Um, and I first just want to thank from Calgary Pied, Hasina Juma and Kathleen Jessamine for all their hard work. And from the U.S. Consulate of Calgary, Casey Bond for all of her hard work as well. Um, and I would be so thrilled right now to introduce the Consul General Holly Wager Monster to give a few opening remarks. Um, Holly assumed duties as the US Consul General in Calgary in July of 21. 
and uh, is a foreign service officer. She is focused on strengthening economic ties between the United States and its partners since joining the US Department of State in 2001. She served in countries around the world, such as Kenya, Poland, Bolivia, South Africa, and Malawi. Welcome, Holly, and thank you for being here today. Great, thank you, Keith, for the warm welcome. And thank you for moderating this discussion today. I also want to thank Calgary Pride for their partnership on this very important event. Uh, and to all of our panelists from the United States and Canada, thank you for your willingness to share your personal stories and for all your efforts to increase respect for the rights of 2S LGBTQ plus persons, including their ability to exercise their own religious freedom. I'm excited to be here virtually as we kick off Calgary's Pride Festival. During Pride Week, we celebrate hope, progress, and promise for the 2S LGBTQ plus community. It's in the name of progress that we need to have conversations like we're having today. Progress towards equality, religious freedom, and inclusion. As Harvey Milk said, it takes no compromise to give people their rights. President Biden and Vice President Harris have taken historic actions to accelerate the march towards full 2S LGBTQ plus equality. They are dedicated to protecting the civil rights of 2S LGBTQ plus Americans by ensuring they have equal access to housing and affordable health care. Ensuring that all qualified Americans, including transgender Americans, are able to serve their country in the armed forces ensuring that 2S LGBTQ plus Americans are leaders at every level of our federal government and protecting and defending the human rights of 2S LGBTQ plus persons around the world. Through the United States and Canada's roadmap for a renewed partnership, our countries are committed to working in lockstep to address all forms of discrimination and exclusion including actions against the 2S LGBTQ plus community. We are partnering with Canada to lead international efforts to protect and defend the human rights of 2S LGBTQ plus persons around the world. I'm very much looking forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists and learning more through their experiences and expertise, advocating for religious freedom of 2S LGBTQ plus individuals. Thank you all so much for, for tuning in and joining us today. I hope you enjoyed this session and I hope you have a great Pride Week. Thanks. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, so the conversation today, you know, it is often thought and perceived in our world that for many people who identify as two-spirit or LGBTQ+, that faith doesn't necessarily fit together with diverse identities of gender and sexuality. But we have some amazing panelists here who have navigated and continue to navigate um, the, these journeys of identity and faith and have found ways of reconciling, but not only that, bravely living out their identities as people of faith and as people within the 2S LGBTQ2 plus community. Um, and this is a complex conversation. And I know for many of us, um, it can be a difficult conversation. And so I just want to um, let people know that we will have um, here some um, resources, as you can see in the chat, and there's a slide here. Um, if, you know, anything we talk about is triggering for you, please reach out for help. Know you are not alone, and there are resources for you, and that we, there are people in this world who walk with you on this journey. Um, we also, um, as you can see, we have um, um, a deaf interpreter, Randy Zwenka, and also Sarah Goodliffe, an ASL interpreter, will be joining us later. Um, and if, um, you like also 
At the bottom of your Zoom, you can either click the three dots more, or you may see a CC live transcript option, and it will turn on closed captions for um, today's conversation. Uh, it's only about 80% accurate, the closed captioning system, so just, and that is with English. Some of our guests will be using other languages as well. Um, and Kathleen here has a poll for us. Um, just if you feel comfortable, let us know where you're coming from. If you are here on um, this side of the border, if you may be coming from the United States, maybe you're from Treaty 7 or elsewhere. Um, we'd like to see who is joining us today. Oh, look at those exciting numbers coming in. I don't know if you can see it yet, um, but it looks like we've got quite a few folks here in Calgary, Treaty 7, quite a few in Alberta, quite a lot outside of Alberta, across Canada, and about 20% joining us from south of the border. So this is wonderful. Um, fantastic. Well, welcome all. We'll, we'll do another poll at the end, um, and we'll just double check in as I'm sure some more folks are joining us. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce our amazing guests. Um, so let me first start off by uh, introducing um, some of the folks joining us on this side of the border here. Um, so um, it is my pleasure to introduce R. W. Hoekstra, White Bear Standing. White Bear Standing is a knowledge keeper, ceremony keeper, and sacred fire keeper born within the Mohawk Nation of the Iroquois Confederacy, an intergenerational residential school survivor, and a 60s scoop adopted out into a Dutch European Christian home. Their Christian name is R.W. Hoekstra, and he is a person who straddles two worlds. A longtime member of the United Church of Canada, he has helped rewrite understanding of Two-Spirit in United Church manuals, contributing to the United Church Irides Living Apology Project to 2S and LGBTQ people, as well as a national survey on conversion therapy. He has served on numerous local and national Two-Spirit organizations and is currently heeding the call into Indigenous ministry with the Sandy Soto Spiritual Center. Welcome, RW. And um, welcome. Um, and then we'll also introduce um, from Toronto, Treaty 13 area, we are delighted to introduce um, El Farouk Kaki. Uh, El Farouk is the co-founder and imam of El Tohid Juma Circle, an LGBTQ affirming and gender equal mosque in Toronto, whose inclusive community has gone on to inspire nearly a dozen similar communities in North America. He is co-founder and secretary general of the Canadian Muslim Union and chair of Africans in Partnership Against AIDS. A lawyer and activist, his legal practice and advocacy has focused on refugee and immigration law, supporting LGBTQ plus refugees, women fleeing gender violence, and those persecuted and living with the stigma of HIV and AIDS. Welcome, <laughs> Farouk. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. And from the other side of the border, um, we have some wonderful guests, and I'm delighted to introduce Rabbi Micah Bakyael. Um, Rabbi Micah Bakyael is uh, the Director of Education and Training with Kishet, a U.S.-based nonprofit working for LGBTQ equality in Jewish life. Uh, they are also the founder of Builders Bait Midrash, a traditional learning community in St. Louis that centers the voice of LGBTQ learners. Rabbi Micah works to equip communities from across the Jewish spectrum with knowledge, tools, and confidence to build communities in which LGBTQ Jews and their families can be affirmed and celebrated. Welcome, Micah. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Great to have you. And also from the United States, from Georgia, we have Garrett Conley. Garrett Conley is the author of New York Times bestseller and Lambda nominated memoir, Boy Erased, which you may have all seen has been adapted into a film starring Nicole Kidman, Russell Crowe, and Lucas Hedges. He is also the creator of the producer Unerased, a podcast exploring the history of conversion therapy in America. 
He lectures across America on radical compassion, writing through trauma, and growing up gay in the complicated South. He is currently assistant professor of creative writing at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. Welcome, Garrett. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's great to be here with you. Excellent. So as you see, we have some amazing people and we're going to have an amazing conversation. Um, to start, I would like to um, just share a little bit about my own journey and why I'm here. Um, so I'm a settler here at Treaty 7 Territory. I was born and raised in Calgary and I was raised in the Pentecostal church, uh, the same church that Dolly Parton uh, grew up in um, and which she wrote a song, my daddy was an old time preacher man, where she writes a line that um, he preached about hellfire so hot you could feel the heat. I knew what that was like growing up and knew that this would not be a safe place for me to come out. Coming out is a journey we, in, for those of us in the LGBTQ2S plus community have to do often and ongoing and sometimes multiple times as we discover new things about our identity. Um, I first came out as gay and um, that was much later in life. It was, you know, in my early twenties because I just sort of had to stop going to church. Luckily I was, had support of my family, um, but it never stopped me getting the hairy eyeball from my extended family and my grandmother of why I wasn't going to church. But had I abstained, it's very likely I would have ended up in a conversion therapy program. Um, so my journey, you know, I had some religious trauma wounds that I'm not going to get into here, but I left the church. But at the same time, I couldn't shake my relationship with the Christian faith. But I was forced to look to other um, religions and faiths to find something more affirm affirm affirmative where I could see myself reflected. And um, because of that journey, I was able to experience many different aspects of faith and faith communities. And it took me a long time to actually come back to the Christian faith. And I never thought I would actually have anything to do with the church again. But three years ago, I found myself speaking from a pulpit at a church for the first time. And now I am on the path to becoming an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. Who would have thought? For LGBTQ2S plus people, there's often this thought that we have to go in, stay in the closet to be a part of our family, or if we come out of the closet that we cannot be a part of that family. And sometimes for me, I had the experience of entering into an LGBT community and going into the closet as a Christian and as a person of faith, because that wasn't a place for me to express that. But as we will explore today, there's many different ways to explore this reconciliation of identities. And I wanna start off by asking that question for all of our panelists. What has your journey of coming out been like? And where are you on the journey of reconciling who you are with your faith? So maybe we can start with, oh, who do I even see here? Whoever wants to pop in. How about we'll start with Rabbi Micah? Wonderful. I am, I'm happy to share. Um, I love that you framed this to begin with, uh, with the notion that being out, coming out, owning who we are uh, is always an ongoing journey. We never, we never get to be done. Thank God. Um, and I actually love that you created a little bit more space around that word reconciliation. Um, I find that a lot of times I get asked the question of talking about my faith identity, my spiritual identity as someone who is Jewish, as a conservative rabbi, and also as someone who is queer and trans, um, and sort of imagining that those two pieces of who I am must be in conflict with one another, and it's my work to reconcile the two. Um, and actually, for me, they are, they are deeply inseparable, um, partly because within my own journey, the moments in which you know, my, my journey towards myself, figuring out who I am as queer and trans, really happened alongside figuring out who I wanted to be as a religious person. I grew up in a family that was deeply connected to the Jewish tradition, to uh, really the same denomination of Judaism that I belong to now. Um, and at the same time, the moments when I uh, was out on my own in college, forming a life for myself, were moments where you get to reflect and suddenly things that were 
um, at least in my life, that were handed to me as part of traditions that I inherit from family are things that now I have to take responsibility for. And those two processes really happened for me at the same time. Um, so on, on the one hand, I never felt like there was this work of reconciliation where I have two distinct parts to, of my identity that I have to bring together. Um, on the other hand, something that I've been reflecting on a lot is that where the Jewish world was at that time, there were big conversations about, um, is it okay, I would put in big quotation marks, to be gay or lesbian, to be bi. There's a little bit of conversation about what it might mean to be trans at that time. Uh, but the big, the big contention rocking the movement that I'm a part of at that time was about whether gay and lesbian people could be ordained as rabbis and as cantors and as, as spiritual leaders. Um, and it was, it was through that process of witnessing that conversation and seeing, you know, on the one hand, the tradition that I'm part of has always been evolving and has always been intellectually rigorous and spiritually connected and able to make changes and be part of an ongoing and moving and breathing world. And that it is critically important that when we're talking about lived experience, that we hear and center the voices of those lived experiences in those conversations. Um, and so for me, it's less about reconciling and more about how do I step into the path that's in front of me um, and really, really embrace the feeling of wholeness. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. As you can see, we're going to have um, many different experiences here. Um, you know, you're just reminding me of my own journey. Coming out never ends. Coming out as a non-binary person has in many ways been more difficult than coming out as gay. And it's something I have to do every day when I introduce myself and my pronouns. Um, so let's pass it over to R.W. Hoekstra, um, a white bear standing. Tell me a little bit about your experience coming out and, um, you know, your journey of navigating your identity and faith. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute again. There you go. Um, Ozo, Wapskiki Kabon, a business class, Gany Gahaga, and Gromway, Mishki Kedado Dem, Oswega Six Nations, and Dunjba, Nishman and Duak. My Christian name is IW. Um, one of the first lessons that we, we learn when we uh, start this process coming home, and uh, as often for many of our indigenous folk, we need to learn uh, our name and our spirit name, if we have one, to let the creator know who is asked to speak and bring some words in a good way for that help. So for me, when I started this process, as we call it, coming home um, a good 30 years ago now, uh, this is what we do, and for many of us, who were not raised with our languages, often this is the very first part that we get to learn. So I always start with that. Um, so I was born of uh, Mohawk of the Iroquois Six Nations Confederacy and um, Two-Spirit and Snapping Turtle Clan. And, uh, just do this. and uh, I'm very honored to be a part of this conversation. So, uh, I want to light my shell because normally when we would be in circle, we would do this. So I wanted to add to you to Mindapin Mabasama Ga Bikirigi in Muyana. I like this. Please take this offering of tobacco for you. And so I have some of the leaf tobacco that I will also add to this. So for all of us virtually around the globe and whoever may be with us on this afternoon. It's really been for myself the last number of years that I've really come into um, a foundation that I've never really had. As was mentioned, I was uh, a scoop child adopted at a young age, uh, raised in the Netherlands uh, with Dutch parents. So I think I've been very fortunate in that part because for us and the Dutch people, um, when it comes to uh, sexual things, it's always been very open far more than uh, many other places in the world. So I never really had too much of the, um, the negativity. And being the son of the, the minister in the church, um, nothing was ever really said directly to me. So I was able to, uh, to kind of grow up and, and be who, uh, whatever came about. Um, I remember one time over dinner, I think I was 14, 15, supper one time, um, 
uh, or actually, pardon me, it was when uh, mom came upstairs to say goodnight and she sat on the bed. You know, when that happens, here comes the conversation of some sort, uh, asking me if I'd rather be a boy or a girl. And uh, I said, no, I, I like being a boy. So that was cool. And, uh, and only one other time do I remember one time over dinner uh, in my early teens, mid teens, somewhere that, um, that I have a girlfriend or a boyfriend at that time. So that duality for me was an easy kind of flow in that respect. I never really had a big struggle with that. For myself, the struggle was the fact that I was First Nations and I still get it occasion. I don't look Dutch, um, but my hair now is starting to. <laughs> and um, that's been the biggest uh, battle for me often and at times still is. But having been raised uh, in the Dutch, uh, uh, was where my father had uh, was stood in and here in Canada, in the United Church of Canada, as is my sister at present, um, I've come to learn and understand and starting at this afternoon, even now, to really be grateful for what I was given because I have the ability today of having lived and living a very dual life both very strong so i have my dutch bible which was my mother's uh in old dutch gifted to her in 1941 so that's almost 80 years ago now on november 1st um and i have my indigenous traditions both of them are extremely strong both of them are are um um as i explained uh, uh in our first meeting with the panelists I cannot tell you how that works up in here. So when I do prayers at times, and I'd start with our traditional, maybe Western style of, uh, you know, God, our father, um, I sometimes in the middle of it switch into Ojibwe a little bit as to um, and, and somehow change it up. But there's only one creator, there's only one God. It's not that there are two, that I have two different ones Maybe for this or that, I should pray to God. And then for this, for that, I'll pray to Gajemnado and, and the ancestors, thinking that maybe one might, maybe in a sense, favor over the other with a particular uh, request or prayer or thanksgiving that I have. So, um, and I've also learned the last few years too that for me, when I'm sitting in church and I can indigenize a service as I'm hearing it that is added to a foundation in my faith that I've never really had before I've already had always had a strong belief but never truly a strong foundation and that is the foundation that has come when I started walking my indigenous world when I sit you know at in circle when we're around sacred fires at ceremonies and gatherings and I've been very uh, fortunate with uh, the elders that I had a chance to learn with when I first uh, started this process of coming back home, so to speak, 30 years ago, that's where we got the teachings in circle, in ceremony, in the lodges. It was that learning about that, that some of it is very similar. That is our church, that's the indigenous church, all the ceremonies, the songs. That is the very part of what, um, with the RCMP and so on, that came and shut that down for many years and decades however we were very smart already then too because some of it like a shaking tent ceremony was brought into the church kind of disguised and became almost like you could say the shaker church unbeknownst to the rcp that will come by thinking we are oh they're just having a regular church service and that would be okay as opposed to quote unquote and saying that about my myself and our people uh dancing wild around the fire somewhere <laughs> out in the bush mm -hmm. um but there's many of our people that are part of the church. And I know sometimes it's a very hard road and especially as a two-spirit uh, person, as the LGBT folk, um, it can also be a very lonely road because for the indigenous folk, um, being part of ceremony, but also being part of church, there's many times too that you get shunned by either one on top of what already has been shunned by perhaps. But the teachings of the two spirit, what I bring about and what I hope and many others are starting to also is what I'm hoping that will bring one person that hears this this afternoon will bring them back from the edge 
And that is, we have a part of our teachings in the, in the uh, Three Fives Day One Lodge and Creator Ojibwe stories of a specific placement thought out by Creator specific for that third being, that third being, which is the two spirit one that stands between the men and between the women. When we have that creation story, when I learned that many, many years ago, it's given me that purpose. So I'm able to kind of been able to handle a bit more of what's been thrown at me over the years, uh, for so many years. And so I'm hoping within hearing that for some of you, because there was a purpose, everything in creation has a purpose. We know that. So why would there not be when it's in the animal world, the plant world, the fish world, the bird life? It's already there, the two spirit one also. Why would it not be with the humans that we were placed here by creator to fulfill those specific roles. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Ow. Thank you. Thank you, IW. Um, let's uh, ask the same question here. I see Al Farouk. Um, and, you know, as we're um, talking, feel free to write any questions you like in the chat. We'll have a chance to, um, we'll be collecting those questions and have a chance to ask those to our panelists um, shortly. So um, welcome, Al Farouk. Thank you. Um, salams, everybody. Peace be with you. I'm uh, on the traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq in uh, what is known in uh, dominant culture as Nova Scotia. Um, and I go by he, him pronouns. And I've been sort of listening to folks and Mika, I, um, uh, I was intrigued by your comment that you are in the same tradition of Judaism as the tradition you grew up in because my journey is, is quite different. Um, so I come from East Africa, from Tanzania. My family left when I was about eight years old because um, my father was involved in politics and in the independence movement, and we got independence as a one-party democracy, which is not a democracy. Um, and the people who helped bring about independence also became a potential threat to the power structure after independence. Long story short, we end up in Canada and Coast Salish territories, uh, also known as Vancouver. Um, my parents were born into a into a small Muslim Shia Muslim community. Um, my father, at an early at some point in his life, started straddling two different religious identities or two different religious communities. The community he was born into, which is an Ismaili Shia community, and the community that he started uh, being. Uh, engaged and involved with, which was the dominant culture Sunni community. Um, I came to Canada at some point. Uh, he began identifying publicly as being Sunni. And so my mother and I decided where we were going to go and, and we sort of went along. And, um, and then in part of my own process, so the question about coming out as a person of faith, I'm a brown person, I'm an immigrant, I have a name that is not European in origin, I am automatically racialized and I am automatically subject to the notion that Islam or the other is always a monolith. Um, and so the notion of a singular Muslim identity of a singular Islam and a singular practice an interpretive choice around Islam is entrenched in dealing in, in white North America. Um, and so to claim space and to claim different kinds of space. Um, so if you're from, and you know, in places like uh, Vancouver and Calgary, I suspect if you're brown skinned from East Africa, people will automatically assume that you are Ismaili, uh, an Ismaili Muslim. It's automatically sort of done. Uh, in other places, it might be, oh, you're from here or from you're, you're from there. But by being racialized and by not having, uh, by having non-European names, you're automatically uh, labeled or identified. And you're already automatically assumed to have a particular faith and a particular manifestation of that faith. Well, that ain't the case for me because I've sort of hopped, skipped and jumped and 
Um, as a, my husband and I were in South Africa a few years ago for a conference uh, organized by the Inner Circle of Progressive, Inclusive, uh, Gender Justice, Queer Justice, Trans Justice Oriented Muslim Space. Uh, ended up talking to two um, African American, uh, an African American couple. Of course, you can tell by the accent and and so on. And they turned out to be Christian pastors. And I said, "Oh, what what denomination?" And she said, "Well, we're non-denominational." And then she said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, we're here for a Muslim conference, blah blah blah." And I'm the Imam. Oh, what denomination? And I said, "Non-denominational." And she said, "I didn't know there were non-denominational Muslims." And I said there are um, and there are more and more of us and so um, the non-denominational is about actually breaking down the structures of history that have been used to to um, create separateness within a, uh, not only a social and political separateness, separateness but a theological separateness so the community I uh, lead up. There's Muslims and non-Muslims in it. There's Muslims with all kinds of religion, uh, of different Muslim backgrounds and non-Muslim backgrounds in it. And we worship in the same place. Um, and so if somebody is leading the prayer who is Shia, then we pray according to how they lead and, 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 and vice versa. Um, for me, my journey you know, I, I, I'm a little bit older, I think, than some of the folks. I'll be 58 in, in October. And so the, the narratives around uh, LGBT rights and marriage rights and so on and so forth weren't even part of the conversation. I mean, I, I come from the era when, you know, AIDS was, ha was having its impact from the, that was my coming out in the, in the, in the 80s, in the middle 80s uh, in Vancouver. And, um, Mm, I, if somebody told me then that, you know, this is where I would be and I would be the co-founder and the imam of a, of, a, of a queer and trans inclusive gender justice oriented mosque space married to my husband with a four year old uh, kid. Uh, we got married first and then we had the kid. It's very traditional, uh, but <laughs> uh, or very dominant culture, I guess. Um, and uh, I, I would have, I would not even have imagined it because those conversations were were not even part of our lexicon, as as you pointed out, Mika. Even in terms of the words, when I started Salam in 1991, it was a social support group for lesbian and gay Muslims, and we were progressive or inclusive because we had lesbians as part of the group, and and you put lesbian in the name first before you put the gay, right? Um, you know, and it was a social support group because I wasn't ready to deal with the theology. I didn't even know that I that that was even a possibility. Um, and so, you know, here we are. Fast forward, like that was in 1991. That was 30 years ago. We're 2021, and the the world is shifting and the world is changing, and not necessarily for the better. But certainly, when it I think comes to queer and trans inclusion, um, there is growing discourse within the Muslim community. I'm going to end on on sharing a, uh, an email that I got, the content of an email. I, um, a few months ago, I was asked to write a chapter for a book on Islamic chaplaincy that's coming out. It's called The Mantle of Mercy. It's scheduled for release in January 2022. And I was asked to write a chapter in there because there was no chapter dealing with chaplaincy uh, for LGBTIQ2S Muslims. And um, I went to get my master's in pastoral studies at Emmanuel College, hence my soft spot for the United Church, right? I didn't finish it uh, for a variety of sort of different reasons, but um, they asked me because of my background and my work and, and, and so on and so forth to, to write this chapter. I got an email a couple of days ago from one of the editors saying that uh, an imam who was the president of one of the largest Muslim org organizations in the United States or in North America um, called her to tell her that he had read the chapter three times and um, he prays that this is what is needed to, to create a cultural shift in the Muslim community and among imams in North America. Um, it's a far cry from you can't be gay and be Muslim. Uh, it's a far cry from that, that dominant culture narrative. 
but it is not just a dominant culture Muslim narrative. It's also what queer Muslims are also subject to, right? Again, because you make Islam a monolith. So I have folks from who have over the years from religious traditions that are as non-inclusive in their dominant manifestations say to me, I, for example, Catholics, oh, how can you, must be really difficult for you. I'm like, is it really easy for you? Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have a central authority. I don't have somebody uh, uh, sitting somewhere telling me I can't be who I am. Um, so, you know, things are changing, things are shifting. The journey is slow. Reformations and change and, and, and revolutions did not happen in a day. Um, and the journey is long. But um, I think part of, the journey, part of the beauty of the journey, and I always say this, is that as queer and trans and two-spirited folk, we really should not be uh, uh, replicating or manifesting the othering that goes on in the dominant uh, manifestations of our traditions. As queer and trans folk, we need to find the beauty that connects us to the rest of humanity rather than divides us. And in my, um, one of my guides and one of my teachers um, is Malcolm X. And when Al Malcolm X came to, to Islam, it, he opened up to the world. Whereas before he was not willing to deal with white people or Christians or Jews, when he comes back from Mecca, he is transformed and he recognizes that, that to uh, the true change comes from working together and working as and recognizing the full humanity. His lexicon was different. It was in the 60s. We're now in, in, in the 21st century. Um, the notion of progressive human rights has to continue in how we talk to each other as queer and trans and two-spirited uh, people of faith. Um, and that's why I'm here. So thank you. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Elfruk. That's fantastic. And um, yeah, you know, this is an amazing conversation. So many people uh, coming together today from different perspectives. Um, and so um, I want to turn it over to um, Garrett Conley now. Um, I, some of you may be familiar with his story. Um, uh, it's been shared uh, widely in a novel and in public speaking and in a film. Um, but do you want to share a little bit for those who might not be familiar, some of your journey and, and where you're at now on, on reconciling and that word, <laughs> your faith and identity? Complex word. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, I loved hearing all these stories. It's just so wonderful. Um, and I love what El Farouk had to say about coming together and um, really building a coalition of queer people um, and beyond. And I think that's really beautiful. It's one of the lessons I've kind of learned from my story. Um, just briefly, um, when I was younger, my I was around 16 when my father became a missionary Baptist preacher. For those of you who don't know um, that denomination, to use the word of the night, um, it's, it's very fundamentalist um, most often. There are exceptions to that, um, and uh, there's a there's an attempt to read the Bible literally. Put that in quotation marks for those of you who realize that's impossible, um, and um, and uh, so therefore there's there's a willful ignorance in some ways towards um, the complexity of the Bible and the history that it was born into. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there was a, a rigid stance taken towards LGBTQ people and their identities. Um, so when my father became a preacher, I was devastated because I knew that I was closeted at that point. I had a girlfriend at the time and, um, and my mom suspected things as mothers sometimes do. And uh, we were kind of like locked into this journey together and, um, to speed over a really difficult chapter of my life, I was assaulted and then outed uh, by the person who had assaulted me. And uh, this person told my parents um, that I was gay and um, a lot of lies mixed in with truths. And I was uh, asked to come home. I was, uh, it was my first year of college. I was a freshman, so I was technically 18. Um, and I, my mom came to pick me up and my dad took me into his bedroom, closed the bedroom door and said, okay, is this true? Are you gay? And he asked me this question followed by, um, will you swear to God that you're telling the truth? And at this point, you know, I was very deeply entrenched in my faith and had a very close relationship with um, this version of God. And I felt uh, really frightened by trans, you know, the, the possibility of transgressing in this way and lying. Um, 
And so I told him the truth. I said, yes, I think, you know, I think I am. And um, his response was that he, he said that he was going to talk to the Bellevue um, Baptist Church, which is in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a giant mega church. And to this day, they've not apologized. Um, they uh, basically, my dad talked to them and they said that um, they had these brochures for a conversion therapy camp called Love in Action. And my dad said, if you don't go here and make this effort, then you won't speak to your family again. You won't speak to your mother. You won't speak to me. You're never being invited back home. You can't come back into this church and we're not going to help pay for your college anymore, which was seemingly the only thing that I was in, enjoying at the time. Um, and, uh, and I just remember thinking, you know, I went into my basement, um, which is, I had like a really cool basement room back home. And, and I went in there and it was like looking around at my childhood and sort of thinking like, well, what can I do? Um, and I looked up like credit because I didn't even know what credit was. I didn't know what a credit score was. And I was like, how do I pay for things myself? And it was just all so overwhelming. And just the thought of leaving my faith behind and my family and the entire world that I knew seemed impossible. It just didn't seem likely to happen. And um, I know now, based off of uh, working with a lot of um, LGBTQ homeless shelters and places like that, that, that uh, tend to those needs, that that's that's one of the ways that it happens right so you you think that you can go to a city and like maybe find a way through but you have no money and and it was just really scary to me um and so I agreed to go um and I guess the part that I want to emphasize of the story is um you know up until this moment I had received pretty much unconditional love from my parents you know um, they were wonderful parents. They supplied me with everything I needed. They were very supportive. When I came into the living room and announced that I wanted to be a writer at the age of nine, they were like, not acting like most parents and saying, well, that's impossible. But instead they said, okay, well, you can do it because you can do anything. And those are really beautiful things that parents can do for a child. Um, and so it was incredibly shocking. It was just like the most shocking thing that could happen to me to hear this um, and for my mom to go along with it. And, um, you know, to move forward in the story, I, I did six months of one-on-one -on -one therapy and then a two-week trial program that was meant to, it was a residential program where at Love in Action, and um, I was meant to, it was meant to help determine how long I was going to stay. So would I stay at college for a year, for two years? Um, and this is the way these places worked. They operated on getting people in and then telling people around them, their family, their friends, that it's much worse than they thought, the person needs to stay longer, they're a very bad case, they're extremely gay, which is very true. Um, spoiler alert, <laughs> it did not work. Um, and, uh, and I went to this place that systematically broke me down and the other people in it. Um, there were people dealing with a lot of different issues. Um, and there were, you know, uh, there were just sessions that I don't want to repeat here because I've repeated them so many times and also they're just, ugh, you know, not fun to talk about. Um, but the one that, that, I, that really did bring some light into my life, strangely, um, they didn't mean for it to, was it was an exercise called the lie chair. Um, and this is similar to an exercise that you might encounter in a normal therapy session in which you would look at an empty chair and kind of imagine a person that maybe you have a problem with or you're upset with or uh, a person who's been very influential in your life and you talk to them as though they're there. Um, it's a bit hokey for me, but, but you know, it's, it's horrible when you're standing in front of 60 people in an auditorium and they're asking you to follow a script that is fitting a stereotype. And the script was um, that all gay men must hate their fathers and be too close to their mothers. It's Freudian, you know, it's just a, a trash reading of Freud. I, I like reading Freud, but I do not like the way they use Freud. Um, and, uh, and basically they, they asked me to yell at this invisible father and tell him that I hated him and that um, I didn't love him. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, but I was a really good student um, and I read the Bible really closely. And, um, and I just remember hearing these words, okay, you know, hate your father and thinking, hmm, 
this doesn't feel very biblical to me or very compassionate, which is what I picked up on in the Bible. Um, you know, of course, there's there's like the random Bible verse that says that, you know, sons may turn against fathers and things like that. But that's not what we usually latch on to. <laughs> that's not usually the message um, that Christ is giving us. Um, usually the message that Christ is giving, I mean, almost always, um, is one of love and compassion and even a kind of, um, for lack of a better word, badass attitude towards, um, you know, the way in which uh, people who are often seen as lesser or strange or, or whatever are the ones that he's lifting up and, and basically saying, you know, you're not better than them. Um, and I remember just thinking like, this is, you know, I've been told about compassion my whole life. I've been told about grace and this is not it. <laughs> um, I've never had a stronger conviction in my life that something was wrong. Um, and it was so wonderful to have that because after so much confusion, after taking in so much self-loathing, I mean, so much loathing, um, the turn to self-loathing and so much hatred, suddenly here I was confronted with a simple truth, which is very rare. <laughs> and the simple truth was that this is not for you. This is not good. It's not good for anyone. Um, and I don't want to hate my father. I choose not to. I'm not going to follow the script. And I stormed out of the auditorium. I asked for my phone back because they take all your uh, belongings when you come into the camp. Um, and they said, oh, no, we can't possibly give you back your phone. And I said, well, it's an emergency. You have to. So they handed me my phone and I called my mom and she showed up and um, you know, they went off, but they went over to the driver's side door and said, oh, he needs to stay so much longer. Um, it's a really bad case. And, um, and my mom sees my face, which is clearly, you know, for the past two weeks has been drooping, sad, not the same face that she had known from her child. And she sees my face looking like my face again, like, okay, he's here. Um, and by then she'd heard about the suicide rates and what had happened with a lot of the people who had gone to these places. And she asked John Smith, who was running the camp at the time, um, I don't know why I didn't ask this before, but what are your qualifications? And, you know, for those of you in here, you probably realize that there is no degree <laughs> that um, entitles you to teach conversion therapy. There's, there's no psychological association that believes that it's not bunk science. Um, and so, you know, he wasn't able to answer the question. He said, I was part of Alcoholics Anonymous and um, I was a marriage counselor. And my mom, you know, suddenly, you know, it was kind of like a veil was lifted, to use a, a cliche, and um, I got in the car, and um, she asked me, you know, are you going to commit suicide, and I don't know if the answer was truthful or not, and I don't even know, I just knew what the answer would do, and I said yes, and she took me home. It was kind of like a test, it was like, okay, well, you did this uh, thing that feels pretty unforgivable, <laughs> are you going to are you going to go along with, with um, me possibly dying in, in the face of this thing? And she wouldn't. And, um, you know, we spent probably 10 years not talking that much, my parents and I. Um, after that, I went into Peace Corps in the Ukraine. Not the Ukraine, sorry, Ukraine. It always happens because people use the in front of Ukraine. Um, so I went to Ukraine and, um, and lived there for three years and didn't speak to them very much, but slowly, um, well, not, you know, pretty much every day from that moment on, my mom started to apologize. She would call, she would leave messages. Um, I wasn't ready to hear the apologies yet. Um, I was uncomfortable with everything and, and just really messed up. And um, my dad started to apologize and, um, <laughs> you know, something happened in me where the compassion that had, or the definition of compassion that I had encountered in that lie chair exercise um, came back to me and spoke to me again. And, um, and I was just like, you know what? I, I want to fulfill that definition and I want to experience it. And it's my choice to forgive them if I want to. Um, and I, I found that I did, but forgiveness is not, you know, the simple thing, right? It's not just like, oh, um, I, I'm going to wipe everything from my memory and everything's going to be okay. True forgiveness is a lot of work. And so I somehow knew this intuitively. And um, I, my mom was, uh, is this 
when I was in grad school, I came back for grad school and um, my mom was in Florida on vacation. And um, I flew to her trip with, <laughs> she was with my aunt and I pretty much ruined her trip. <laughs> and I said, hey, um, I just, I really want to hear your side of the story. And can you just tell it to me without, I'm not gonna interrupt you. I'm just gonna put a recorder between us and you can take breaks if you want to, but I just wanna hear it. Like no judgment, just let me hear your story. And um, she talked for six hours <laughs> without moving. Um, pretty much crying the whole time, explaining that at 16, she had married my father in a town of 100 people. She had listened to basically what everyone had said. It wasn't an excuse, it was, it was an explanation. And, um, and what I heard was this split brain that so many of us have had who have undergone some sort of trauma like this, the, the one part of the brain that knows what is true, right? that knows that when she looks into, sorry, I don't know why that's going off, um, that knows when she looks into her kid's face, what the truth, I'm sorry, students, okay. <laughs> um, that knows whenever she looks into her kid's face, what the truth is. And then the other part of her brain where she's just trying to be a good Christian wife. Um, and, um, oh my gosh, sorry, <laughs> I got it turn this phone off um so yeah anyway um whenever I encountered that story I was just so amazed to see that our journeys overlapped um and to understand that we had basically gone through something together it wasn't separate and this is why I go back to El Farouk's words um this idea of coming together some of us never make when, when people have uh, certainly hurt us a lot, um, but it's a choice that I made and I, I'm, I no longer really identify as Christian, but I do, uh, I have absorbed so much of what I read um, in my childhood in the Bible and I've absorbed so much beauty from the people who loved me um, before there was this ultimatum. And the result is that my father, um, you know, is so much more inclusive in his church. Uh, I, I went to visit not too long ago, and I love going to visit because everyone there is kind of like, <laughs> okay, you're here. Um, and, and I think it does them good, you know, <laughs> it does me good too. Um, and, uh, and when I was there, there was a lesbian couple in the back, and I was so confused at first. I was like, what, wait, have you heard the story? Are you, <laughs> why are you here? Um, and they said, well, your father invited us and um, he talks with us a lot in his office and he's really supportive. And of course, my dad never told me this. He's a very like traditional um, Southern man <laughs> who's very quiet. And so he never told me he did this, you know, and I, I found out through them. And um, it was just this small thing that that was so beautiful. And my mom um, she has, she's become kind of this person online, um, at least some of her Twitter and Facebook followers, um, message her like every day. And it's, it's so many of these queer kids who are kind of lost and she guides them. And I am amazed by it every day. I mean, I don't have the time for it. I don't have the energy for it. It's like, you know, um, but she's doing that work and she loves it because it's fulfilling. And it's almost like it's the role she was meant to play. Um, and I guess what I would say is that um, my journey was really dark and um, it, it made me question just about everything in my life, but um, it led me and my family to a place of deeper understanding. It's not, it's not the surface level understanding of you know, tolerance or acceptance. It's something much deeper than that and much more human. Um, and it goes beyond our identities and it changes us every day. And for that, I'm just incredibly grateful. And um, yeah, thank you for listening to my story and sorry for that phone. <laughs> you got some fans. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that. You know, um, it really resonates with me. Um, you know, this conversation, um, I met a counselor, um, her name's Kelsey Hoff, and she talks about this concept of spiritual deconstruction 
as a metaphor that we all sort of inherit this spiritual home, this inner landscape from our families, from our communities. Um, and the process of spiritual deconstruction and reconstruction is sort of like going through your, your, your concept of religion, your ideology, your worldview, as if it were a house and you go from room to room and saying, oh, that wallpaper that's there, is that actually me? Do I want that? Is that reflective of who I am? And, and you know, sometimes it's a matter of, you know, remodeling your room. Sometimes it's bringing in the bulldozer and starting from scratch. You know, we all have different experiences in this process of sort of discerning what in our tradition um, is true for us and, and what, you know, what, what isn't. And, and, and that can be a difficult process for all of us. And you, you said it so profoundly is that it feels like sometimes the whole floor is pulled out from under you. And these are the times that maybe you don't have your family. You don't, you're not able to have your faith community as your support. So my next question would be for those of you, like, and for those on this call who might be going through this process, how did you find a um, network of support? What, you know, who did you reach out to that helps you perhaps, you know, find some inner stability to your foundations um, that maybe give you the strength to navigate your family and navigate your faith community again, but it seems to start within. So um, yeah, well, there you are. Let's go with the rabbi, Micah. Let's see what you have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really resonate with this notion of it can feel like the floor falls out from under you. Um, I remember for me, one of the moments where I knew that I was trans um, was actually, it was the first moment that somebody else came up to me and saw me and perceived me that way. Um, I was actually visiting a space in which uh, in the Orthodox movement of, Juda of Judaism, prayer spaces are divided by gender. It's very binary. There's either or and literally one side of the room or another with a wall in the middle. So I had walked in and I was sort of having this moment of not particularly liking it. And someone came over to me and very quietly said, it's okay. We can make space for us. And suddenly it was like this beautiful moment of being seen and cared about and valued and welcomed. And this moment of the floor just fell away from underneath my feet. Um, Cause it turns out people who are cisgender don't actually have a list of 10 reasons why they're not trans in their head. This was news to me. Um, and it was really through that community of other queer and trans people and particularly other queer and trans people in uh, Jewish traditional spaces who were really just being badasses and saying, nobody gets to take away from me any part of who I am. And nobody gets to tell me what I can and can't bring into this space. Um, and there are, you know, there are the, the living rooms and the dining rooms where um, any, any queer or trans person can just sort of, you know, walk in, knock on the door at three in the morning and you've got your family there. Right. And that's, that's another family. Um, and those are, those are the spaces that have carried me through. Mm, thank you for saying that. You know, it's interesting. I, you know, as a non-binary person, I remember this experience of going to a, a, a Sufi temple and um, I just, I came in late and I sat down and I didn't realize. And then I look over and all these men are like, and I'm like, oh, and I'm sitting with the women and children. And, um, you know, I've had these experiences going to meditation retreats where I'm, I'm put with the men as, because it's supposed to be less distracting, but for me to be in a room full of men is not, less distracting. And one of the first affirming experiences I had was at Anyaha Cree feast to honor the buffalo. And the elder, I was an escapo, a helper, and she said, oh, you sit right next to me in the middle, in between. She saw who I was and made a place for me. And that was really beautiful. Maybe RW have something to share about that, um, that same sort of question of, of spiritual deconstruction and reconstruction. Um, oh my gosh, yes, you brought me some memories, that's for sure. Um, I had already started learning about in the mid late 70s, I'm a little bit older than what I look like. So Farouk, we're in the same company almost. <laughs> um, and uh, about kind of the, the honor that we had as, as two spirit folk. And I had, uh, I had found a book that was published um, 
I believe it was Maurice Kenny, if I'm, don't quote me on that 100%, uh, a Mohawk writer, but it was an anthology of different stories in there. And uh, there were some poetries, there were some writings in there and stories of native two-spirit folk across uh, our lands about Turtle Island, Spekmanque. And um, I had also at that time already learned about uh, one of our ancestors that has always been a, upheld quite a bit with an indigenous uh, two-spirit folk of uh, Wewa, uh, Zuni um, um, two-spirit person. And so I knew a little bit about those histories, but I didn't have the placement. In 91, when uh, I got sober, I had, uh, I'm a recovered alcoholic also um, from uh, about 11, 12 years of hard partying drinking. Um, when I started coming to this road, you know, God has an incredible sense of humor because from about age six, seven, despite my parents, my Dutch parents, who are my parents and my sister, trying to keep the pride that I had as a little boy of being a native Canadian boy instilled in me. I had a school teacher that at one point said to me on one of the times we were back in Canada, the sooner I forgot that I was native, the better it was because I had a better chance at life. And um, I never forgot that. And mom always said something had changed that day when I came home from school. And from that point on, until I got sober, so that was from about age six, seven to, uh, I don't want you to do the math, but I have to be honest here, <laughs> till I was 31, 32, when I had started getting sober in 91, um, I had pushed that all away as far. Nobody could mention it. I, I just, I stayed away. In 91, when I got sober and I, I went through a, I looked up at the time, people were not really going a lot at that time yet to uh, treatment facilities as, as, as they do now today. It was kind of new and it was still a big secret kind of, but I found a place that was called Bradash at the time in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it was a specific LGBTQ2 uh, treatment facility. And I knew enough already, I could not have gone to a regular uh, facility because I would not be able to talk about what I needed to speak about to get rid of my demons. So I went there, uh, they did things along uh, the Southwest, uh, indigenous traditions. I came back and I was living in Southwest Ontario at the time. And who became my first sponsor? A strong Ojibwe Madewan grandmother who sadly passed away uh, two years, a year ago now from um, um, Cape Croker became my first sponsor. A Madewan strong anti-teacher. She gave me those very first teachings of, of that tobacco. And this was her gift at the time. This is now a good 30 years old, my to personal tobacco patch. Um, and it was through her that I also learned about the placement that we had and we still have. But in the early nineties with two other friends who are two spirit, we would be in Toronto and we would be walking around the streets practicing a drum song joking about how one day we would be the three grandmothers, the three little nookmas going around Scott McQuay, bringing these teachings to the people. Because at that time, it seemed there were very few of us as indigenous two-spirit folk trying to, to reconnect, trying to relearn all those lost ceremonies and teachings and, and, and histories. And um, uh, so, um, so that's what, that's what happened. And then the placement started for me kind of also in a natural flow, which I wish I could have and still today give to everybody that, that needs that placement of community and extended family. And um, I was up in Peterborough in those days then and um, to one of the powwows uh, with the big drums. And I didn't know all the ins and outs with ceremony and teachings and placements. I was all learning this also. And so I thought I'd go stand behind the big drums in the inner circle of the power. Um, so I stood behind one of the men and it was one of the friends that I know who sat least passed away a number of years ago now, um, Terry Rogers. We got sober around the same time. And um, I learned later in a very quiet way, Carleen taught, taught me, it's generally the women that stand behind the men at the big drums or the wives of the girlfriends. 
But then if you're asked to choose spirits, I would do that also. So as they were drumming, I remember one kind of looking up and kind of going, you know, that look what's over there. So, and, but nothing else was said. And I stayed there. I stayed. And since then, I've done that often. And I think, and also with the Native Friendship Center at the time there in Peterborough, um, I would get a call. Uh, and Ali, my friend, was there also at the time, also uh, going to Trent University in Peterborough. And we would get a call sometimes, can we come in to the center because we needed to help cook for a week or such. And I would ask, cook what? And I thought the women were doing that. But that, so that's how I learned the role in practice that many of us thought, and some people still think, I believe worldwide, is so historical. You know, it's like dinosauric bones and those things don't happen anymore, but it's very present today still. And so within that, I found my placement more and more and more and more slowly. Um, I, I also learned that um, from Carleen and, and then the women in the ceremonies that I was able to be at, um, it is also a placement that as the two-spirit one, I don't go and take over. So if you're at a ceremony, as an example, I was somewhere uh, for meetings in Winnipeg a couple of years ago and at the close, we had a circle outside and uh, there were some of the women were present, of course, also with them from the meetings. And there was a question about, does somebody know a water song to honor the water, to honor the women? And so none of the women present knew one and I had been uh, taught two of them, but then I can't just say, oh, I'll do that. I asked the women permission if I can bring the song to them. So I have, I asked, that's the etiquette and protocol. I don't just take over just because I'm too spared gay so I can go either route. So I can just insinuate myself in that. So, and, and I adhere to that uh, very much so to this day. It's also one of the, um, the Medeo and etiquette protocol where kind of the strict ones <laughs> as we're known and, and the longhouse Mohawk people too, but um, so it's within that and those placements that more and more um, it felt automatic. And then occasionally something would hit me and I realized this is the work at this very moment that is creator specifically given in my placement here on Scott McQuay that once in a while I get to do a piece of that two-spirit work that needs to get done, whether I like it or not. Because there are many times, because it takes a lot out of us, a lot of me, because we're constantly, as gay, lesbian folk, wearing different masks all the time, all day long. We're so good at that because we need to fit in for work. Then we need to fit in when we go shopping. Then we need to fit in when you go to the cafe. Then once in a while, you need to go to maybe a stag or something. And so then suddenly you got to butch it up or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> All those things. So we're very good at that. So it takes a lot out of us. And I'm also, for myself personally too, I'm very cautious as to where I say yes to or where I go. Mm. Because I'm not, we can smell that before we're, we're in the middle of it when we realize it. I'm not a, a, a horse and you know, a pony show type Indian. So I'm not gonna go somewhere just because they need to fill their quotas or feel good. Oh, look, we have an indigenous person at the table. I'm very conscious with those kind of things too. Thank you, RW. Yeah. Um, you know, that I think what you speak to there is so important about finding yourself reflected in your tradition and how that can be transformative. And so I want to ask um, maybe Al Farouk this. Um, you know, in the, in the Christian tradition, there's a, often some scripture gets quoted as marriages between a man and a woman. But if you continue reading in that chapter, Jesus goes on to say, but to those who can hear, there's also a third gender. And he gives a blessing to the eunuchs, to the third gender of people. Uh, and that for me, to see myself reflected in scripture was profound. So I wonder, has there been anything in your own tradition uh, or scripture that has helped you or helped your community? That's interesting. Um, I was getting all geared up to answer the... the, the, the Sorry to... <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I do want to actually tell you that I 
you know, like I grew up in Vancouver and I came to Toronto. And when I came to Toronto, because there's a critical mass, so again, you know, it's a question of, of, of community and where you end up and what your community is like. And, you know, the Muslim community is not, not theologically monolithic, but we're also culturally and racially not monolithic. Um, and so sometimes for myself coming from a minority within a minority and then flipping communities. So the mosque, the Sunni mosque that we ended up in was like, we were the only family like us. Um, and I'm an only kid and I was always very close to my mom. And like uh, Mika, like you spoke about like your community and, and, and being gendered space and, um, you know, within this mighty community, it's gendered space during prayer, but not at other times. In other Muslim communities, depending on what they're like, it's like there's a permanent uh, segregation wall. Um, um, so it's, uh, when I came to Toronto, I started meeting other uh, queer uh, identified folks who were of Muslim heritage. And uh, I remember thinking, uh, would it be nice if we had a place and a space where we didn't have to explain and justify ourselves, where we could just be in our dysfunction and our contradictions and, 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 and so on and so forth. Um, the process of reconciliation, but I had been exposed to Christianity and to Judaism uh, quite extensively. Um, that was the lucky part about being Muslim, um, was that we... Uh, and certainly my family's interpretation and understanding was an embrace of, of, of diverse religious tradition. So I was the only you know, non-Christian kid at my assembly in my school in, in, uh, in England, uh, because my parents wanted me to know the Bible and they wanted me to know uh, traditions. And that to me has become uh, an incredible source of wealth because it allowed uh, me to uh, make linkages and uh, we have commonalities and differences. So coming to your question about the difference about what I find in the scripture, um, you know, we're thrown the story of Lot. Uh, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are not named. They're called the cities of the plain in the Quran, but it's the same story because we know that because of the names of, of Lot and, uh, and, and the other Hebrew prophets that are also contained within, within, within Quranic, within Quranic uh, text. Um, but the Quran does speak of men who have no desire or need of women and women who have no desire and need for men. Um, and again, you know, these are interpretive choices. So when you've got some cishet guy who's been brought up in some kind of concept of, mass, of toxic masculinity, they're not going to read that to say that's space for, for people like you and me. Uh, they're going to interpret that differently, right? So, um, so that process of also excavating uh, RW, you, you spoke about um, refining our stuff, like our some of our narratives as Muslims have also been buried through the process of colonization, of European colonization, the introduction of laws based on Victorian, Christian, European, British, whatever, uh, notions of morality and immorality and so on and so forth, which have actually erased the rich tapestry um, uh, around gender and sexuality that today in the 21st century, uh, Muslim spaces are identified by how women are dressed and the segregation of the genders, whereas this has not always been how Muslims have been viewed or identified even in the West. So Palestinian Christian author Edward Said in his book Orientalism speaks about the exotification of Muslim peoples and how we were considered to be sexually licentious for the, for, for the prudish uh, uh, European Christians, right? things have changed. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of clients, refugee clients out of Uganda and the narrative and out of other parts of Africa where the narrative now is homosexuality is Western. Whereas in fact, the laws that criminalized homosexuality were brought to us by, by our white colonizers and our white occupiers that erased our narratives and our stories and our nuances and our spaces. And so part of our journey is to unpack not only those traditions, but the oppressive structures of colonialism and imperialism that have actually erased those right and that we have also bought into and that our dominant cultures 
uh, our dominant communities may have also bought into. And that's also part of what we should not buy into. Um, so I think in, 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 for me, within the Islamic tradition, I've been unearthing all of this sort of stuff. Um, and I had a conversation with somebody, nothing to do with sexual orientation, but there's a verse in the Quran that refers to the, to the fragrant herb of paradise. And some exegesis says it's basil, and other says it's pot. And so, <laughs> you know, take your, take, take your, take your theology. Uh, what is erased and what is not erased and what is medicine and what is not medicine and what is, uh, um, what is our lived reality? In Islam, we don't have an image of the divine. We have no anthropomorphic images, but we know Allah through the 99 most beautiful names. And so while I, I always preach that when, though we're all made in Allah's image, we make Allah, we make God in our image. And we have a choice about how, how we make that, about the God that we pick. So in Islam, you can pick your God. Your God can be the beloved or can be the crusher. Um, so pick your Allah. And I think we all do that uh, ac across religious traditions. Within my tradition, I think it's, it's more evident because we have these 99 names. And so I think we need to step back from recognizing not only are we all made in God's image, but that we also are caught up in this trap of God, our image. So we make God ignorant and, and misogynist and transphobic and so on and so forth because God reflect, we create God to manifest, to reflect us rather than the other way around. Mm, thank you for that. I can't believe that we're almost out of time. Um, we're supposed to be finishing in five minutes. I'm hoping that maybe we can go for a few more minutes longer than that, if everyone's okay with it. Um, do I see us nod? Maybe if you need to go right away, that's okay too. But um, this is such a juicy conversation. I don't want it to end. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I want to ask another question around this. Um, you know, as um, people, all of us, all of you here, have had to come out and 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 be a public leader um, to share your story publicly, um, to lead a faith community publicly, and to speak up about your theology publicly. And you know, I work a lot with um, faith communities that are on the journey of becoming affirming. Some of them are afraid to because they don't know how to answer to those people who ask, "What will we say?" Um, and so I, I have a question. How did you find the courage to profess publicly another way, to share your truth, to share your story, and to share a theology that is inclusive? Um, does anyone want to speak to that? <laughs> I'd like to speak to that. Um, just very briefly. Um, I come from a family where of, of, act, of activists. My father was a public figure and so on. So I was always taught to speak my mind. But my mind that I was taught to speak about was around issues of, of um, racism, uh, multiculturalism, uh, religion, uh, Islam, and, and interfaith work, and, and so on and so forth. So And politics and human rights. And so I was always opinionated about that. So then I come into my own journey of... Rec of um, uh, reconciling or, or embracing my, my, my sexual orientation, how can I not? Um, there's a, the Canadian Race Relations Foundation did a, a series of videos on Beyond 150 celebrating Canada's, uh, Canada's 150th. Um, and uh, the doc is titled The Accidental Activist because my journey has been about trying to find spaces for myself and not having found them. Um, I've been privileged enough in many ways um, that I have been able to, to try to create those spaces. And so my activism is, 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 is on some level accidental because it's my journey towards, towards finding um, affirming space and, and community. I was really struck a few years ago when uh, there used to be an organization in Toronto, I don't know whether it's international, it was actually by the Jesuits. It was the Jesuit Center for Social Faith and Justice. And we often hear of social justice, but social faith, and this is so paramount in Islam as it is, at least in my understanding of Judaism as well, um, and so on, the, the notion of, of social faith, of, of being able to worship and practice and have ritual in, 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 in community. Um, 
and social faith has been a very important part, part, part and parcel of my own coming to terms and embracing and not only then embracing but also moving forward to create a theology or to to be part of an expansive theology of inclusion um so that's that's my journey Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to have to close shortly, but I want to answer, um, I, I'll put forward one question here. Um, and and um, so when, this is from Daphne. When you encounter people who defend their homophobia, racism, misogyny with religion, what do you say? Do you debate them? Question their interpretation? <laughs> Al Farouk shaking his head. Maybe Micah, Garrett, do you have any thoughts about that? You know, I do. I, I have the tremendous good fortune that that the work that I get to do every single day is going into religious communities and having these conversations. Um, and so what I'll say is I don't debate anyone on my legitimacy as a human being. That is never up for debate. Mm. The one answer that I will give is however you might interpret this verse, this verse, or this verse, find me the place or not find me the place, but however you might interpret verses and what they say about particular expressions of gender or of sexuality, we also have verses that tell us we are always responsible for treating one another with respect, with dignity, with kindness. And just because you have a different read on that verse, your obligation to that other person doesn't go away. That I'll debate. Beautiful. Thank you, Rabbi Micah. Um, I can I can bring a little to that. Um, I've spoken, I guess, for the the past five years, nonstop, um, at different places. Some of them churches, some, some of them more affirming than others. Um, and I I know I always say that everyone has a different role to play depending on your skill sets and where you are in life and whether or not you want to do this work. Um, I. I feel like my life has been divided into two very strange camps. Um, I'm part of academia that is, you know, sometimes progressive. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then I go back home and I am uh, back in Mountain Home, Arkansas, which I don't know if you've seen lately, but has made the New York Times twice for being the uh, fastest uh, spreading COVID a town in the country. Uh, because people refused the vaccine on grounds that uh, were basically already in the end times and things like that. So it can be incredibly frustrating to have this whiplash constantly. Um, sometimes I'm sitting in spaces that are where people um, have never set foot in the South and they can annoy me. And sometimes I can be in my hometown and of course they can annoy me. Um, and so my patience grows thin sometimes. And um, what I've found is uh, just like kind of checking in with myself and knowing when is the right time to have a debate. Um, is this person who just called me a faggot in the bathroom going to listen to me whenever I debate his use of that word? Probably not. Um, is, is the person who stands up in a Q&A and declares something evil about me going to listen to me? Probably not. But the other people in the room might so I can have a moment where I won't necessarily teach that person or they won't necessarily learn anything from me, but I can have a context in which other people can learn. Um, and I just really lean into that idea of dignity and self-respect, which is, you know, if someone disrespects me on a fundamental level of me being a human being, I'm not gonna answer back by disrespecting them because I respect myself too much to do that. Um, I'm not going to let them lower me to their level. Um, I'm not, and I, and I sometimes won't debate them when they do that. Um, and that's just a boundary that I found really helpful, but it's one that I've had to develop over five years of speaking. And I've certainly stumbled several times because sometimes you're really tired, you're jet lagged, and someone says something really rude to you and you just snap <laughs> and you're like, um, no longer, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to be nice anymore. I'm sorry. Um, and it has happened. And, you know, what I'll usually find is like, it's okay when that happens, you know, like it, we're human. Um, but I guess um, the only other thing I'd add to that is that it, it can sometimes be a little stressful. Um, I'm sure all of you know this. 
um, being in the public eye all the time and having to perform a role um, that is basically a kind of um, a persona to help, you know, the movement, people, you know, you're trying to come from an honest place, but there is a, a distance and um, sometimes it snaps <laughs> and you just start to say um, something that you really think and, and then you feel bad about it and you go into, you know, self-doubt and stuff. And so um, I've tried to be nice to myself and to others who I've noticed might be a little tired. Um, mm -hmm. It just happens. I mean, right now it is so hard to even like have any energy <laughs> to do anything because of the way the world is and how horrible everything is and um and i think we really have to protect um protect our boundaries in this period mm. because if we you know like one time if i snap uh, in a way that is really ugly I, I really don't want that to affect some young queer person who was looking up to me or found my story inspiring not that that always happens but you know you got to kind of be on watch and um i never wanted to be an activist like i never set out to do that i wrote my story honestly i felt like i had to i got really lucky in its publication and and the timing of it and then it sort of came to me it was like um you know that idea of like you know the seat not to use a seat metaphor again after talking about the lie chair but like you know, you know, you sometimes you have to take the seat that's given to you, um, and and it's it's there, and you have to ask yourself like, is it worth taking that seat? Because now my life will be this, um, and so I, I saw an opportunity and I took it, but it's not without its costs, as all of you know. Thank you, Garrett. You know, I think this is why being a leader is why people often call this a calling and not a choice. And I think for all of us, um, you know, we, we, some things we do for ourselves, some things we do for others. And you bring up such a beautiful point that right now, compassion for ourselves as much as compassion for others is so important because we're all human, we're all navigating this difficult world. And it's a world that there is room for diversity. I think from this conversation of identities of gender, of sexual orientation, but of all manner of identity, of ethnicity and the culture. And, but it's, it's also, there's diversity of ideology and worldview. And we need to make space for that too. And that's where it can be tricky to navigate. But I think I'm so grateful for all of you for sharing this. And I hope that we can continue to work together and to all those who showed up, um, there's some wonderful love coming in from the comments, lots of star eye emojis and hearts. Um, saying thank you for such wonderful panelists. So please, everyone, give a silent, if you're in your homes, round of applause. Feel free to send your hearts into the chats. And, and thank you all uh, for being here to our wonderful panelists. Thank you to the U.S. Consulate and to Calgary Pride for this wonderful opportunity. Excellent. I see uh, Holly here. Did you want to say a closing remark, Holly? No, not at all. I was just cheering everybody on. Thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you all. Be well in the world and uh, know that whoever you are, you belong here and then there is space for you to be fully you uh, as a person of faith, as a person of diverse gender or sexuality. There's room for you here and the world needs you and find your tribe, find your community. We're here for you. Take care, everybody. Good night. <laughs>